I'm extremely glad that the university's library has decided to put on this series of three talks by women about Newton. Usually I'm not a great fan of special treatment for women and I certainly don't believe that they should get special priorities or privileges in getting grants and awards. On the other hand, I think a, lo a lot of women who are doing history of science and other academic subjects are absolutely determined to avoid being labelled primarily gender historians. When I was a postdoc, I knew virtually nothing about gender history and a senior man asked me to give a lecture on gender studies precisely because I was a woman. And my reaction to that request was not only to turn it down, but immediately to study the most masculine male dominated subject I could think of. And that was Isaac Newton. And that was about uh, 20 years ago. And I've studied various aspects of, of him since then. And I've got a degree in physics, so I'm fully equipped to study Isaac Newton's science. I've actually become far more interested in his reputation. And that's what I'm going to be speaking about at the lecture in the university library. It's so common to hear Isaac Newton referred to as a scientific genius, as though he's somehow above ordinary mortals, that all he had to do was sit in that garden at Woolsthorpe and watch an apple fall from the tree. And that's absolutely the image I want to get away from, partly because the concept of a romantic scientific genius wasn't invented until the 19th century, so it's certainly not how he was regarded at, at the time. But also, Although I have no doubt he was extremely, extremely gifted and talented, there's a very real sense in which his reputation was promoted by himself and his allies during his own lifetime, and also that he's been the subject of a sort of Newtonian PR campaign ever since. So what I and many other historians are concerned to do is get away from this idea of him as some sort of superhuman, and also put him back in the context of the 17th and 18th centuries uh, in, in which he lived and look at the people around him and also look at all the other activities he was engaged in. We remember him for the laws of gravity and mechanics, but he was involved in a whole load of other activities as well. And those are the ones I'm going to focus on in my talk. So the way I've set up the talk, I've decided to start with a not a very well-known picture by William Hogarth, probably one of England's most famous painters of the 18th century. And it's what's called a conversation piece. It's a, it's a picture of a living room with lots of people carrying out different activities. And on the mantelpiece, there's a large bust of Newton and he's staring out over the drawing room, almost as though he, he were God. Uh, controlling events beneath him, although by this time he was already dead. And there's a little makeshift stage at the back, and there's four children on it, and they're performing a play by John Dryden. And then in the audience, there's some royal children, there's some royal governesses, and there's lots of aristocrats, and then there's some portraits on the wall. And the portraits on the wall beyond belong to Catherine Barton, who was Newton's niece, and her husband, John Conduit, who inherited the mastership of the Mint from Newton when Newton died. And so I use that, uh, that picture as a sort of springboard. I look at different parts of the picture and use them to explore various aspects of Newton's life. So the first part that I look at is the stage, the play that's being performed. And Hogarth was very, very specific about the play, which scene it was, exactly what was happening. And it, the play is basically about the Spanish conquest of the Aztecs. But it's, it's also, it's got a love story in there. It's got stories of honor and revenge. And so in one sense, all these little children who are watching the play are learning about all the social and political intrigues that they're going to be involved in when they grow up, because they're all going to be very influential people when they grow up. But the play is also about the relationships between the Spaniards and the Aztecs. And of course, in 17th century eyes, the Aztecs were inferior to Europeans. But in addition, Dryden makes it look as though the Spaniards a singularly cruel and uncivilized. So there's this idea that as an English audience, you can sit back and luxuriate and congratulate yourself that you aren't as barbarian as either the Aztecs or the Spaniards. But in fact, in reality, Britain uh, was involved in the slave trade 
just as much as Spain. Our whole economy depended on getting gold from Africa, sending slaves over to, over to America, and then using that money to import sugar into Britain. So our whole economy depended on it, and Newton was very, very deeply involved in that. He had a huge investment in the East India Company, for example, and at the Mint, he knew quite well that the gold was coming from Africa, and he was responsible for organising what was called the Gr Great Recoinage of 1696, when a lot of rich people became very rich and a lot of poor people became even poorer than they had been in the past. So Newton was very much involved in the foundation of Britain's capitalist society in the 17th and 18th century. He was not some scientist who was floating above all of that. He was deeply involved in it. So the second part of the picture that I talk about is the audience. And there's some royal children there. Uh, there's a governess of one of the royal children is picking up a, fa a fan that one of her children has dropped. And that's a reference by Hogarth to this fan that drops under Newtonian gravity. So there's Newtonian rev references right through the picture. In the back, uh, the prompter, uh, with his back to the audience is a man called Desaguliers, who was the chief Freemason of Britain. He was Newton's major experimental advisor, great fan of Newton. He also taught some members of the royal family, and he was involved with teaching them about natural philosophy. And then in particular, there was Caroline of Ansbach, George II's wife, who knew Newton very well. Newton himself was involved in the court. He manoeuvred to keep out Leibniz, who was his great rival. And so there's all that court active diplomacy going on that Newton was engaged in as well, which we don't usually think about. And then the third and the fourth sections, I try to bring in some women, because if you read most biographies of and Isaac Newton, you'd think he lived and moved in a totally male world, but of course he didn't. So one very important woman in his life was his niece, Catherine Barton, who looked after him for 20 years. And there was a very scandalous story put, put forward by Voltaire that the only reason that Newton got his uh, mastership and wardenship at the Mint was because his niece had been illicitly involved in affair in an affair with the Earl of Halifax, who was married to somebody else, and that this had all been kept hushed up and that he'd bribed Newton with his position at the Mint. Uh, so there was a lot of debate about that, and so that's a debate that I, t I talk about uh, in the talk. Of course, a lot of Newton's biographers were very reluctant to even contemplate that anything like that had been going on. Another Newtonian woman that I personally have carried out quite a bit of research into is a woman called Elizabeth Tollett. And she's, she's sort of known in Newtonian studies uh, because she wrote an elegy on Newton on the night that he died, and that's sometimes quoted. And I decided I was going to find out a bit more about who she was. It turns out she's a very, very intelligent woman, very well educated, very, very good at maths. And her father was a naval officer. And at that time, both the Mint and the Navy officers were housed in the Tower of London. So she, had, she lived in the Tower of London for about 10 or 20 years, just as Newton had done. Newton was lucky enough to be able to get out because the noise and the smell was absolutely appalling. There, it, there was a menagerie, all the soldiers were there. Apparently they spent 30,000 pounds a year just clearing the manure from the horses that drove the mint machinery. So it was not a good place to live. Elizabeth Tollett was trapped in there while both her elder brothers went to Oxford and Cambridge and she constantly lamented that they were wasting their time there drinking and gambling and how much better it would have been if she'd been able to go to Oxford and Cambridge and her poetry expresses very eloquently the frustration that 18th century women could feel trapped at home. And then in the last section I talk about Newton's bust, Newton that's sitting on the mantelpiece in Hogarth's original picture and I talk about Newton's bust and how important busts were uh, for spreading Newton's fame, how much people bought busts and used them in a way that we don't do now. And then I finish by talking about a marvellous woman, my favourite woman in the whole of history of science, who's called Emily du Chatelet, who lived with Voltaire for about 20 years, and she translated Isaac Newton's Principia into French, and it's still the only French translation. And 
um, she, she was one of the main people responsible for convincing French people that Descartes was wrong and that Newton was right. And then to finish up, I took, there was a man called the French Newton, Laplace, who wrote the version of Newtonianism that we have now, which is rather different from the kind of Newtonianism that Newton himself practiced. So the, the work of this French Newton was translated back into English by yet another woman uh, called Mary Somerville. And she was never allowed into the Royal Society to present her own papers, even though they published them. But what they did instead at the Royal Society was to put her bust in the foyer. So I finished by showing these two busts, one of Isaac Newton and one of Mary Somerville. And he's been elevated into a great hero. And although she was known as the Queen of the Sciences in the 19th century, we very rarely heard of her.